This week on Crossfeed. The Pope takes on the man. Tom Cruise, the new Jesus. Hospice and prostitution. The church not allowed to provide sanctuary. And the Vatican's high crime rate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pastor Jim Butler from uh, St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston, where we had a major terror alert yesterday, thanks to Cartoon Network. (laughs) Heard about that. (laughs) And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa, where we never have terror alerts because rural Iowa just isn't a big uh, target for terrorist attacks. But we were attacked by the Moonbees from Teen Aqua Force yesterday. <laughs> and um I heard one of those things is up on uh on eBay. <laughs> yep. One of them is. It um uh it was it was quite a deal really. I, I didn't even know about it. I was um in the southern on the suburbs on the south shore, but yeah, you know, they were just overwhelmed because all these phone calls came in from these people finding these things. They didn't know what they were. And you know they, and you know they brought in water cannons and the bomb things. About a million dollars were spent yesterday dealing with all this. And uh, what really ticked me off though was when they arrested the poor, the two poor guys who put them up. Cuff them, boys. We're putting this dirt bag away. You know, I mean, you know, what are they going to, you know, put out a warrant for the arrest of the, the head of the advertising company who thought the stupid idea up in the first place? Let's arrest yeah, Ted sure. Turner. He owns it now. He owns it. <laughs> well, make oh. that's, that's my only thing is, you know, they, they, they went after these two guys who had this great press conference, by the way, today, and refused to answer any questions except by, about their hair. Okay, lady. I love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> now that's comedy. <laughs> and their lawyers oh. standing over there looking going... What is with you guys? And you know, <laughs> they're 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 you know all they going. Well, we think we really have really, really good hair. <laughs> when will this insanity end? So it was uh, it's been pretty interesting up here. When will this insanity end? Yeah, sounds. Well, um, I my weekend or my week wasn't nearly so exciting as that. <laughs> although we had our share of. It, it wasn't really so much excitement. Um, I mean, we went to a, a birthday party up in Wisconsin, but when we came back, we found that our guinea pig had passed away. Oh, poor little and, uh, oversized rat. So, yeah, we were, um, the hardest thing was telling the kids. They were pretty upset when we told them, um, but we're going to, we're going to get a couple of them. Um, to replace them. And uh, so they're looking forward to that. In fact, I've uh, got a friend who's a breeder. And uh, so they just had some born breeder in, as in guinea pig breeder, not in the um, the slang term that you probably hear around Boston. Well, I don't know. I just, why would you want to breed guinea pigs? I mean, I'm serious when I call them. People we used to like have, me. Uh, we used to have two of them, and I, as far as I was concerned, they were oversized rats. Um, just had no use for them at all. <laughs> when we got our pit bull, I wanted to let them oh, go out and go play with a pit bull for a while. So, <laughs> sorry, this never well, an animal they're... I cared much for. Well, we can't have cats or dogs because the kids have cousins who are allergic to them. And plus, we travel so much that. Um, on you know various weekends, we'll pop up to Wisconsin for a couple of days or whatever, and um, it's just you know we'd have to find kennels and all that kind of stuff, and it just doesn't really work. And guinea pigs are actually you play with them, and yet you can still, if you're going to be gone for a couple of days, you can just leave them in the cage and make sure they have enough food and water before you go, and you're good to go. Yeah. So they just squeak all the time. Um, they are kind of loud. <laughs> Especially when they hear the refrigerator door or a plastic bag they think might be carrots or something like that. Yep. That's okay. My pit bull's a beggar. We go anywhere near the refrigerator and he's there looking at us. 
button something. I could go away, dog. Anyway, well, let's head into the first story. Um, and this first one really hits me because it's an issue we're dealing with here in, in Massachusetts right now. And that is um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and gay adoption. We should flee in terror. In this case, not in Massachusetts, but in Scotland. And uh, the uh, <clears throat> Scottish people out there passed a law saying, um, government passed a law saying, if you want to be licensed as an adoption agency, you have to do gay adoptions. And uh, so the Catholic Church is going to do the same thing they did here in Boston area and say, well, fine, we just won't do adoptions anymore. But then they turned around and they said, wait a minute. Why are we going to cut down a, you know, what we think is a, a valid ministry? We think that we should be allowed to do it. So we're going to continue doing adoptions. And when somebody comes up and files a complaint, they'll tr shut us down. And we'll sue the darn government for uh, breaking religious freedom. Yeah, that's kind of how it's done nowadays. If mm -hmm. you don't like the law, you break it and test it in court. Uh, you know, and it really creates an interesting dilemma for churches because as a church, on the one hand, we must obey God rather than men. But on the other hand, we are to, you know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and we're to, um, to honor the government because it's God's representative. But what about when the government tells you that you need to do something um, that goes against what you believe and, and teach? Right. In which and, case... You know, at that time, you, I mean, they could say, fine, you know, we won't, we just won't do this anymore. But at the same time, the reason they're doing it is because they believe that it's our responsibility to help people. Right. And again, this is something that we're dealing with up here in Massachusetts right now. And, um, you know, I am very pleased by the, 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 their decision. This is what I felt. Um, we should have, it should have happened in Massachusetts is for them for us to have simply said, you know, we're going to defy it, and you try and get us, and we'll see you in federal court. That foolish law. And uh, to well, me, and that's I'm, I'm positive. First, you know, in the United States, religious freedom, First Amendment rights would trump, you know, state anti-discrimination laws. Help! Help! I'm being repressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you know, beyond that. This is kind of a, it's an interesting thing about having a, um, a democracy like we have and, and um, which is a very similar kind of situation uh, in Scotland, that part of the law says, basically, it's basically implied that you can break the law if you want to test it in court. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're wrong, you're going to face consequences. But it's, you know, it's implied that they can do that. You know, that's a, that's a tough thing when we talk about needing to follow the law. But when, when it's an unjust law, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if you think that the, the speed limit should be 20 miles an hour faster, that you just go ahead. I mean, I suppose you could, but I don't think that you've got much of a leg to stand on there. Well, but I with something like this, where it contradicts the Bible, um, as well a church... Part of taking this, this is civil disobedience is what it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of being civil disobedience is being willing to, you know, deal with the consequences of your actions. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been reading a book on leadership by, uh, about Martin Luther King. And, you know, it was just fascinating. You know, I grew up in that era, but I was you know, five, six, seven years old, so I didn't know really what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really interesting, you know, how... Yeah, they were perfectly willing to go to jail. They knew that's what it was going to take. And, you know, one, one of them, you know, but that was part of their um, uh, strategy, actually. You know, get, mm -hmm. get, to, get, by, get 30,000 people out there marching and let them jail 30,000 people. What are they going to do with all of them? <laughs> you know, that was, that was part of yeah. it. But that's, you know, I think sometimes there is this issue is, is a law just? And sometimes it can only be decided in court. Um, there came up a situation in uh, was it Los Angeles Airport, I think it was, in the Jews for Jesus. Um, you know, it was passing out broadside, and the, 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 the airport tried to stop them. 
And uh, so they initiated what they called a friendly lawsuit. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're basically so that it could go before the judge and the judge could say, yes, they have the right or no, they don't. But unless somebody sues somebody or something like that, you can't get it in front of a judge for the judge to tell you what's going on. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. So I'm very pleased with the, the, the direction that the Catholic Church has taken in this, this situation. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how this goes. This is a huge thing. Man, there are so many news stories having to do with this going on. Um, it's just a, it's a humongous thing in, uh, in Scotland and in the UK as a whole. And I think it's going to set a precedent for um, other parts of Europe and, and uh, maybe even the United States. I'm wondering, you know, if, if the Catholic Church wins on this, uh, is that going to spark some lawsuits in the United States uh, or, you know, a, a similar kind of thing and using the what happened in, in the U.K. as a precedent? So um, this could really have far-reaching effects. It could. I am very don't like to use foreign law to make decisions in America, but uh, well, this true. is an issue that we're going to be dealing with um, nationwide, you know, because as, as mm -hmm. states put it in, you know, non-discrimination codes that you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation. And in Massachusetts, that means if... Uh, you know, you're an adoption agent. You can't tell uh, a gay couple, you know, really it's against our moral code to, to help you. However, you can go to XYZ adoption agency down the road. They're going to charge you the same thing we do. They can take care of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, You're not allowed to even do that. So, uh, yeah. And it's also... You know, to so give another problem that's choked here in the United States is it's bringing some fault lines between us and the ELCA. I did not know that. Because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, they don't have a problem. And so here we are in some certain situations like us in New England, and we jointly own Lutheran Social Services. And... Oh yeah, that could really cause a problem. And it's it's a it's a huge problem for us. Uh, it's in, it's even bigger in Massachusetts because the the Commonwealth demands that we have complete wraparound services. Not only adopt if you want to have a foster home and you want to do foster care and you want to you have group homes and we have like three or four group homes for teens, then you mm -hmm. have to do gay adoptions too. It's all part of the same thing and then we if we say we're not going to do the adoptions then we have to shut down the group homes when will this insanity end so it's just a wow. real real it's a it's a it's a legal mess one hand but then there's a theological mess because in some one of the our participants taking place in some dialogues with elca kind of brought here's here's the scriptural version view of of um, of homosexuality and this is why we're having a problem with this to which a very high-ranking person in the ELCA out here, let me put it this way, uh, said, well, I think the Bible's written for heterosexual males. Uh? Yeah, that's that, that's what you, the Bible says, but that doesn't apply. You're crazy. And we're just, and, our, and the, the people I know who are taking the Missouri Synod side are going, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... So, you know, when I said when I saw this one, it really hit hit me and just, you know, were part of my own situation. In full disclosure, mm -hmm. by the way, I, I, I adopted my two younger children through Lutheran Social Services here in New England. So it's. Uh, uh, you see, here in Iowa, you have Lutheran Social Services or they just renamed it not too long ago. It's Lutheran Services. That's the ELCA one. And then it's Lutheran Family Services is the LCMS one. Right. And I mean, never the twain shall meet. So, well, actually, they do because all of them are part of Lutheran Services of America (LSA). And oh, is so, it? yeah, so they're all kind of part of this nationwide network. Which, by the way, people don't realize this, but Lutheran Services of America is the largest religious social service network in the country, bigger than Catholic really? Charities, bigger than United Way. It is the largest in the country. 
I didn't know that either, but uh, my district president happened to serve on the um, board of directors of LSA. So uh, huh. he, um, yeah, he was quite quite proud of that. But we'll see. We'll keep following the story out there in uh, mm-hmm. Scotland, and we'll see how it winds up affecting us here. Because it's uh, speaking going of out. the Roman Catholic Church and crime. Nice segue. <laughs> well, I, it was it was too easy. All right, what is the most crime-ridden place on Earth? Las Answer, Vegas. The <laughs> <laughs> Nope. <laughs> well, at least, uh, no, no, as far as cities go, it's the Vatican. Well, that would mean it's also probably number one in countries, too, because the Vatican is its own country. <laughs> yep. So there you go. Boy. Yeah, this is out of Fox News. And um, it, it was just really interesting to read this uh, that, yeah, it's. Um, on a per capita basis, it's, uh, you know, uh, 1.5, uh, crimes, uh, per person, uh, 20 times the corresponding rate in Italy. It's, which is really interesting considering that the Vatican has, um, the Swiss guard, uh, one Swiss guard for every four citizens, museum guards, and police. And yet, um, Cuff them, boys. Now, wait a minute. Since Vatican City is mostly made up of priests and the Pope. <laughs> now, don't go there. <laughs> I'll have to set up, post the the um, comment line up on this part of the podcast so people can call you. <laughs> is this the Papal Mafia no. at work here or something or what? <laughs> <laughs> no. What, what these crimes, mostly what they're talking about is take pockets. You know, and and it's presumably not being done by the actual, for the most part, I would expect, um, the residents of Vatican City, rather um, tourists who are picking the pockets of other tourists, or you know maybe people from um, from Italy in nearby regions that come to the Vatican um, to pick the tourist pockets. So, um, you know, this this is not another big scandal or anything um, within the Roman Catholic Church. They, they've got enough already, thank you. Um, well, you know, but, uh, I mean, this is if, if you've ever I mean, been this there. is from the Holy See official. I mean, this is yeah. these are actual numbers. It's it's not a um, it's not just somebody making up these numbers. This this is official from them. They they admit to it, but. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, even though the Vatican only has a population of 492, you go there on any given day, and there's a whole lot more people there than that. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, if you've ever been through St. Peter's Cathedral, there's plenty of places where you could you know, easily have your pocket picked. Uh, you walk along the wall, to heading over to the Sistine Chapel, and there's just beggars all along the wall. Uh, yeah. You know, so... Um, the, you've been there. The colonnade out there... You can walk through that, you know, through 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 Michelangelo's Colonnade, and there's again plenty of places it wouldn't be hard. Oh yeah, I was in high school, and uh, I really? got to spend. Uh, my brother was in the army, and so we went to go see him in Germany, and then we took a bus down to, to Italy. Yeah, and uh, went to out went around Florence, filthy city, and uh, then we went to uh, Rome, and we spent uh, three or four days in Rome, I think, and uh, we were like a hundred yards from the entrance to the Vatican. So uh, hmm. we went out there to the, on the piazza, and we went to the uh, Vatican, uh, the, the St. Peter's Basilica. It was, it was tremendous. And got to walk through the Sistine Chapel before they cleaned it up, unfortunately. Uh, but it was a, just a tremendous uh, time. But yeah, there's, it's, there's plenty of places that could happen. Uh, what I thought was interesting about this was two things. Number one, 90% of them get away because they go across the border into Italy, uh, you know, which is, what, 100 yards away. And uh, <laughs> you know, the other one is, even if they arrested them and tried them and sentenced them, they'd have to put them in Italian jails because the, the Vatican has no um, prison system. Cuff them, boys. <laughs> We're putting this dirt bag away. Huh. I'll be back on the street in 24 hours. We'll try to make it 12. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, you know, um, 
<laughs> you make them go to church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, don't ever use don't ever use making people go to church as a as a punishment. You know, I, I've known people that when they were growing up, their their parents forced them in, and you know, and made it wasn't just hey, we're going to church because that's our family and that's what we do. It was um, it was like. If you don't behave, you're gonna go. You're gonna have to go to church, you know. And they they made it into a punishment. And they grew up and said, "Oh no, I, you know, why why should I punish myself? I'm not going to church." So and they have a real negative attitude toward um, any kind of church ever since. So I don't know. We're talking. I don't know. I haven't. No, I think they should. I think the punishment should be going to church, and they have to sit there and smell the incense and listen to the bells ring, and, you know, I'll tell you, if I had to sit around that incense for a while, that'd be punishment for me. <laughs> and uh, and and only Latin masses. That's right. <laughs> you know, that, that would be... We have ooh. no idea what's going on. I have no idea what that meant. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, let's see. We have the beggars on the Vatican wall. How about the, the homeless at a church in Long Beach, California? And uh, this church apparently has um, been allowing homeless people to sleep outside his church. And um, the, you know, the, the, problem, the people there say, you know, the neighbors, it's a problem. We don't like it. Get rid of them. And he's saying, no, they can sleep out there if they want. It's what Jesus would want us to do. It's what everything we stand for is tied up in this issue on letting them sleep on our sidewalk. Okay, now maybe um, it's just me, but why don't they do something so that they can sleep inside? You know, that's what I kept thinking. And, I, and maybe they don't have the facilities, but I thought, you know, since they have this situation. I would think that if they reached out to the, you know, if they said to the community, look, even if if they don't have the resources or facilities, if they said, look, we want to take care of this. We we obviously have this problem that there are a lot of homeless people in our, um, in our community. We need to help them. Well, we're trying to help them. Um, if you don't like them sleeping on, you know, on the on our steps or sidewalk, then. Um, you know, help us build them a shelter. How hard can it be to put some cots in the basement of the church for a shelter? Yeah, I mean, they'd need somebody there to, to man it and stuff, and I imagine there's regulations and all that kind of stuff that can be, you know, you have to have certain kinds of, certain number of bathrooms or whatever, you know, fire exits and all that. Of course, you probably have to have that just to have people, um, you know, congregating in the church anyway, so... I, I hate to say, this is uh, one of these things where they're outside. I mean, you know, why worry about if you have a certain number of bathrooms? Do you want these people sleeping out on the sidewalk? Do you want them inside somewhere? Yeah, you know, I don't know if you remember the... I don't know if we covered the situation that they had out in Virginia at the one church where the um, city said that they could not feed the hungry. Because the the, the 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 kitchen wasn't up to code, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, if they don't eat the church, they're eating out of dumpsters. How do you get so big to do food of this kind? Yeah, which is better. You know, so you know, here you're dealing the same kind of thing. Um, so I don't know. I just you know, it's what Jesus wants us to do: let them sleep on the sidewalk. <laughs> I think that, I mean, their intent is good. I, I mean, I, they're right. Yeah, we need to help people. And you, by saying, you know, what if you're homeless and they say, no, you can't sleep here. Well, where are you going to go? Obviously, if there was a shelter around, they would go there. I can't imagine anybody is choosing the sidewalk um, over a shelter with a cot. Right. So, you know, this tells me that this church needs to say, look, if you don't like it, Come up with something better. I mean, that's something that I find myself saying a lot lately is, don't complain unless you've got a better idea. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah. you know, they, they, and he says too. He says there hasn't been any violence. There's no, you know, uh, drug trafficking that anybody you know can can see or prove. I mean, you know, there may be some, but you know, there's, there's nothing obvious. Um, you know, so you know, what's the problem with them sleeping there? You know, the neighbors just don't like it. And it's not like it's a 500 people. No. It's only a dozen or so. He says. Yeah, you know, it's it's bad for property values. Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. And, but, yeah, sometimes you have to look at people as more than just a blight to your property value. You have to look at them as people with, you know, they don't have property at all. That's right. So, you know, if you help them, then um, maybe that will help your property values. There was a uh, church... I stayed at one night. It's coming home from the San Antonio Youth Gathering in 95. And uh, there's a church south of Nashville. And we spent the night there. And, uh, yeah, we called around to see if there's a place we could, you know, sleep. But they go, oh, yeah, come on over here. We've got everything you need. They had cots. They had uh, showers there we could use. They had a washer and dryer we could use. I mean, they had everything we could ever ask for. And, uh, it was in this neighborhood that these houses were million dollar houses. These are all record, record executives everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. this, this is just funny. This kind of church road is one church after another, uh, right next to each other and, uh, went in and, uh, the Missouri Center has a thing called the Lutheran Church Extension Fund for our non Lutheran people. And it's a kind of a Lutheran savings and loan out of a, 200 people in worship on a Sunday morning, maybe it's less than that. They had over a million dollars invested with LCEF. Wow. So that kind of gives you the, the idea of the kind of the incomes that the, you know these people had and stuff. I mean, it was a very, very wealthy church. But during the winter, they had a homeless shelter in this church. That's why they had all the cops and the showers and everything. Yeah. And they, huh. every night, I think they told me they had 20, 25 people sleeping in there. Um, so it was really kind of, it was really, really yeah. very nice. So, you know, there again, there is a need for us to take care of the poor. There is a need for us to take care of those. But, uh, you know, I, I just not sure I, you know, and I, I guess I kind of back this pastor, though I, you know, I'd really like to look at the people in the neighborhood and say, what if we got a developed a, um, Homeless shelter inside the church. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we don't know the situation, though. That's we true. don't know. I mean, you would think that somebody at their church has, at some point, said, "Hey, let's do that." But and I mean, you know, who knows? We don't know what kind of facilities they have, and maybe it's, you know, it could be that it's it's a, one of those churches that doesn't have like a fellowship hall kind of thing or something like that. Maybe it's just basically the sanctuary and that's it. But, I mean, you know, I don't know. So. Yeah, there's, but there's got to be uh, something they can do. I think. You'd think. I mean, you know, like I said, if nothing else, this is when you you have people from the church, uh, you know, representatives go to the city council and say, well, let's see what we can do about this problem. Let's fix it. Right. You know. What can we do? What kind of shelter? But, uh, can let's we get do? Habitat for Humanity in here or whatever. You know, let's give these people some homes. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I also always say, you know, don't ever say we can't do it. Say, how can we? Right. And uh, that's well, you can't always do. say give them homes because some of the homeless are mentally ill and they don't want to live at home. But, uh, you know, what can we do to develop some sort of shelter that they can go to instead of sleeping on the side of Right. What can we do in right. that respect? Ah. Uh, Speaking of handicaps, um, Tom Cruise. No, the other one. <laughs> control, you must run control. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cards like came to my mind. Handicap, mentally ill, Tom Cruise, it all goes together. I'm not crazy. 
The person that we're actually talking about is not mentally ill. He just has a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, which is a pretty nasty uh, muscular disease and sufferers usually die by their 30s. Um, his name is Nick Wallace. And, and uh, uh, parents, this is a time where you want to fast forward. You know, I think that we need to take the clean tag off of our podcast. It's not explicit. We try to be uh, implicit. But you know, some of these stories just really aren't appropriate for kids. So, Anyway, um, so there's this 22-year-old guy, Nick Wallace, who has muscular dystrophy, and he is in a church-run hospice. Now, you got to get this through. This is, this is founded by Sister Francis. It is a church run hospice is a Christian hospice. And what does he want? He wants. He doesn't want to die a virgin. That's right. <laughs> I mean. He wants to experience sex before he dies. And so what do so, they do? They found him a nice girl. <laughs> Well, sort of. We're going to get a, another bad review at iTunes if you keep laughing, though. <laughs> I'm sorry. I decided, hey, I submitted this story, and I was sitting there reading this going, what the? <laughs> Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so a um, lady of the evening came. And um, paid for by this. She specializes uh, in the disabled. Yes. And founded in, uh, this 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 in the magazine for the disabled, and they had a um, interesting night. Um, I've together. heard of specialists like doctors and specialists, uh, theologians, specialists in all different fields. This particular occupation, I didn't know there were specialists. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't really need to know, but that's okay. You know what I out. found interesting about this though? That was his comment at the very end. Wallace said the experience was not quite what he had hoped. It was not emotionally fulfilling. But the lady was very pleasant and very understanding. I do not know whether I would do it again. I don't think you're happy enough. You know, and it's interesting that he got his wish, and he's like, and? That was pointless. Mm -hmm. yeah, kind of reminds me of Oscar Wilde's famous description of sex. Um, the passion is quick, the pleasure is fleeting, and the position is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> You probably never heard this that is, one. This is the reality. <laughs> yeah. That when you you know this is this is a beautiful thing in the proper context. But out of its God given context, it's just not the same. No. And I and now I'm married and so I this this is not a concern for me. But and I can understand, you know, there's so much hype about how great and wonderful this thing is. Well, yeah, it is in the proper context. But, you know, so much of it is because it's the context that makes it special. Right. Not, you know, not the, the physical, you know, whatever happens with your nerve endings. So... The other sad thing about um, yeah. this, though, and I, and I really have to wonder about, you know, why would a church, you know, enable this to take place? I mean, she herself ad ad admits it, uh, that this founder, she says, uh, Sister Frances described Wallace as a delightful, intelligent, aware young man. I know that some people will say, you're a Christian foundation. What are you thinking? But we are here for all faiths. And for not. It's not our job to make moral decisions for our guests. We came to the conclusion that our duty is to support Nick emotionally and help ensure his physical safety. 
Um, I mean, at what point do you look at it? You're right. You are there for all fates and for none. You're absolutely there. But you, you can say, you know what? In this, we cannot support you. We cannot help you. We cannot, you know, we can't. Well, what it comes down to is, as, as a Christian organization, they should have said, look, we want to help you, but this isn't helping you. That that would not be helping you. That would not be to your benefit. Just because you want something doesn't mean that it's good for you. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> and quite frankly, I don't think that that's necessarily to his, um, for his physical safety either. I mean, talk about diseases and stuff like that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so I would, you know, there, are, I think she could have, you know, I said, you know, this 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 is not a this is not a good thing. And uh, but you know, I, it's one thing to be there for people of all faiths, but that doesn't mean that you dilute your own faith to be there for them, because then you're not providing them the unique gift that. The Christian faith gives. I mean, we have a beautiful understanding of marriage. We've talked about it before on our show. That you know, this is a this is a reflection of the love God has for us. And so, you know, let's instead of cheapening it, let's put it in the context that God intended it, and show how beautiful it really is. I got a bad feeling about this. And to show the greater reality that it points to the reality of our relationship with God through Christ. And by that reality, by pointing us to that, through faith can help to overcome the trials and struggles that happen because of whatever troubles we have in our life, whether it be some kind of handicap or, you know, or whatever it is. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It was kind of a sad story to me. You know, the church just kind of it gave away its moral foundation, you know, in this. Um, well, there's a guy in need, and they did not provide for him the way they could have. Right. You know, they could have just given him so much more, but instead they took the easy way out. And uh, although, you know, let's be honest. If they had said, no, we're not going to do this, and that got out, there'd be plenty of hue and cry, who would, you know, what are these people forcing this guy on the morals, yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, uh, but I'd rather, I'd rather do that. That's, that's, that's where Paul says, you know, you're better to be accused, you know, punished for doing good things. And to just say, hey, this is, this is, this is what we're about. There is evil there that does not sleep. Oh, well. It can only be attributable to human error. It is a sad situation. Well, speaking of sad situations, Tom Cruise time. There you go. <laughs> I was trying to come up with a segue. <laughs> That's how you come up with a speaking of crazy, and I was trying to do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm ragging on Tom Cruise so bad tonight, but... Um, it's just too easy. Yeah, it is. I mean, any guy who believes you're taking that, the easy way out, Jim. Ah, uh, probably. But any you know, guy who believes you could in help aliens, him, you but know, instead probably. you're doing the easy decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I apologize. Apologies to any Scientologists that are. <laughs> you think there's any Scientologists? Watching us? I don't know if they are. They pull it to us. If there are, I, send us a note. I would love to know. <laughs> that'd be uh, that'd be fascinating. Anyway, um, yeah, the uh, Church of Scientology leader, um, uh, David Miscavige, I guess, is, has um, reportedly told Tom Cruise that he has been chosen to spread his faith around the world and compares him to Jesus Christ. Tom has been told he is Scientology's Christ-like figure. Now, my wife asked me a question when I shared this story with her. Can we crucify him and see if he rises from the dead? Lord Vader. Yes, Master. Right. And, you know, 
Boy, no control. I'm trying to address this story maturely (laughs) and without ridicule. Oh, good grief. And it is really hard. (laughs) (laughs) You can't do it. I, I've, you know, I've I've got a million jokes going through my head, but I I think that um they could come across as being at least perceived as a bit blasphemous. So I'm not. It's nothing against Jesus, um, or Tom Cruise, but <laughs> you know the thing is, Scientology teaches basically that there's sin in the world because um because of of an alien infestation. Mutants are very real. I mean, I suppose it's, you know, but we just call it sin. And I I mean, I I suppose that our story of the Garden of Eden is equally unbelievable people, but this was thought up by a science fiction writer. Well, you know what L. Ron Hubbard said? He was not a very good science fiction writer. If you ever read any of his stuff, um, I don't know if you ever seen John Travolta's movie based on one of his books. His books are about as good as the movie, which wasn't very good. But anyway, in fact, it was awful. But um, he once said, if you really want to get rich in life, start your own religion. And he did. So he did. And he got rich. And he got rich. He died very rich. I mean, I mean you would think that that right there ought to clue people in. You know, um, and they are among us. George Lucas started his own religion too, not really intentionally, but you know, I think we probably mentioned this on the show that Jedi is the number, is the number two most popular religion after Christianity in the UK. It's huge. <laughs> Jedi. So oh, that's I don't just, know if it's number two, it's, it's it's just another version of Zen Buddhism. Two. Basically, yeah. Uh, and George Lucas tell you that he'll be a flat out. He he Buddhist, so it, it, it's directly out of Zen Buddhism. Uh, but no, it, it it's just a you know crazy thing. And and well, the other thing, of course, is that Tom Cruise is you know very much against psychology and psychologists. And who is he criticizing for being on uh, 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 a drug? For depression. I can't remember somebody he, he criticized last oh, year. Yeah. I just don't follow all the uh, I, I don't either. But but I'm sure it, what I remember it really about. jumped out at me because my wife suffers from depression. And my wife's on uh, hmm. well, Butrin, I think. Yeah, I think it's well, Butrin. And my daughter is too. And I mean, it just a world of difference. You know, there's a chemical imbalance there. I don't know what this stuff does, but just just a world difference in their lives. And, um, you know, so, you know, I'm here he comes along and saying, you know, bad, bad, nasty, nasty, don't do that stuff. You know, bonk you on the head, buddy. You try putting up with it. Well, that's because Scientology says that you have too many engrams that you need to purge yourself of these, you know, or midi chlorians or you know whatever you want to call them. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of the opposite because they're bad instead. Of... Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you need to go through these, you know, um, these phases and that. It... Scientology is fascinating to read about. From a, it's interesting to study the same way it's interesting to study um, the the science behind Star Trek or Star Wars or something like that. I mean, you know, I like those books that show the Star Wars vehicles and the sort of um, break apart and all the different, the, the kind of theoretically how they would work. You know, it's interesting to study that way. But you're not going to find me looking at it, um, at Scientology and, and going, oh, 
this is reality. I mean, boy, that's a, you know, that's a big difference. It's one thing to say, oh, this is an interesting system. It's quite something else to say, oh, oh, uh, aliens, infestations, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, whoa, 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 hold on a minute here. So, um, <clears throat> but to say that he's like Christ, that's a pretty loose analogy. Um, he's, I, I mean, I would say that he's definitely, um, the biggest name in Scientology and has probably, um, been instrumental in a number of people, um, becoming Scientologists. Um, but at that point, I'd almost have to compare him to kind of a wacky apostle Paul. Um, no, you know, Tom Cruise is not the Jesus, the Christ of Scientology. That would be John Travolta. Have you found Jesus yet? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's really hard to make these. <laughs> <laughs> the Twelve Apostles of Scientology. Now, all right, here you go. Dan Brown. All right. I want to see a, um, a Scientologist Last Supper. <laughs> All right, now there's Tom Cruise, there's John Travolta, and the one sitting next to Jesus, that's Katie Holmes, not John. <laughs> I think on this that note, we, we better end it for tonight, Dale, because I think we're not going to go up any at all. Oh, <laughs> Folks, if you're yeah, really listening kind of to this, you home. may want to comment to us. And uh, say some interesting things about the two of us, like, what are you on tonight? Uh, how much caffeine have you Nothing had? Nothing really. <laughs> you know? Or did this you guys share some bottle of wine? Caffeine-free gingerbread tea. Oh, gingerbread tea. Diet Dr. Diet Dr. Pepper from Christmas. at my end. Uh, so, Dale, how do could they get in touch with us? Well, I know one. You can email us at crossfeed at gmail.com. You know, Bob. Email. And send us your email. Or right? you can call our our voicemail at two zero six two zero two zero eight one nine. You can also go to our website and leave comments on the stories anytime. And I guess as long as you're commenting on the story, you can always comment on on the two goofs doing the the podcast as well. Uh, you don't have to have a username for that, but again, we ask you if you're going to leave it anonymously to please keep it clean and polite and all those kind of nice things. Um, and, you know, don't be rude with with other people on there. Um, but please go to the website. Please uh, post stories. Please comment on stories. Uh, please comment on our podcast. We're here to serve you. We don't serve their kind here. Also, wow, well, you know what? <clears throat> if, uh, I'll apologize in advance if the, any of the audio is at us, because on my end, I didn't really hear much of any of that. Um, but I'm sure that you, our listeners, will have heard that just fine because Jim's the one recording it. Um, but uh, also want to thank our sponsor, uh, pdaperforms.com. Uh, they provide all our hosting and bandwidth. We really appreciate that. And um, they, if you have a Palm OS device, you want to go check them out. They have great software um, nice graphic user interface, uh, and uh, it's just they take you know the the built-in Palm stuff just isn't all that pretty, and so they pretty it up, throw in some you know extra features and stuff. Nice stuff. So go check it out. So and yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you at the website. Post your comments if you're <laughs> if you're embarrassed to admit that you actually watch us or listen to us. You can post anonymously. But <laughs> but we would appreciate knowing you know who you are at, at least uh, to differentiate between the anonymous people uh, so you can use a screen name and um, by the way if you are logged in that will keep track of your points you get points for leaving comments submitting stories and things like that and while right now points don't do you any good in the future they may. And, really? Um, I got 522. Yeah, well, what can I get, Dale? Deal or no <laughs> deal? Well, unfortunately, Jim, you're affiliated with the website, so Aww. they're of no value to you. 
Um, <clears throat> but uh, but to the rest, I. I'm hoping to, in the um, future, and I'm not sure if it's near or far future, uh, have some kind of contest or something like that, uh, where every point that you have counts as an entry into the contest to win something. And it's basically, at this point, a matter of coming up with a prize. Uh, so if anybody out there is interested in uh, uh, some sort of sponsorship um, spot and you'd like to donate some... Um, some sort of uh, prizes that we could give away on the show in exchange for um, for us uh, mentioning you on a, a show or four. Um, contact us, crossfeed at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail and uh, we'd be happy to, you know, to work something out with you. So, but uh, meanwhile, and, and until we get that figured out, uh, if you start posting now and, and make sure you're logged in when you do, um, you can start racking up the points now, and that'll uh, work for you in the future um, at the, when such time happens that we can start doing that. So, with On that note, it's been good to have you all tonight again. Thank you for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful Groundhog Day tomorrow. Uh, be listening yeah. to find out what happens with Puxitwani Phil, Phil out in beautiful Puxitwani. And then sit down tomorrow night, get a good glass of wine, and watch Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, one of my absolute all-time favorite movies, a uh, film not too far from my first church. So uh, go and enjoy it, and um, have a good night. Or if you're from Wisconsin, it's uh, Jimmy the Groundhog in Sun Prairie, uh, not too far from my old haunt. And um, although, to be honest with you, if those groundhogs have any brains at all, they're going to stay in their holes. It's cold. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Puck to 20 fills the real guy. Don't don't worry about this Jimmy guy. Okay, last question, Dale. <laughs> Bears or Colts? What's that? Bears or Colts? Who's taking the Super Bowl? Bears or Colts? Oh, see, my favorite team is the Green Bay Packers or anybody who's playing against the Bears. Mm-hmm. So I have to go with the Colts. But honestly, um, if the Packers aren't playing in the Super Bowl, generally we still record it, but we fast forward through the game and just watch the commercials. <laughs> you don't watch my new Super Hey, Bowl Apple's going to have one this year. They are. Cool. Yeah, and, and the speculation is that they are going to announce a limited time uh, deal with the Beatles, that the Beatles music will be available um, at the iTunes store. Hmm. So... Thank you for watching This Week in Tech. And, <laughs> and I have, uh, I, 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 since I was in Chicago, well, outside Chicago, Rockford, I, I'm, I'm going to have to support uh, support the Bears this, this time, I'm afraid. Although, Lovey Smith and Tony Dungy are very good friends. Uh, Lovey Smith was actually one of Tony Dungy's assistants at one time. And they are both very committed Christians. They call each other virtually every day during the season and talk and pray together. I did not know that. <laughs> cool. So a little, so it did have a, a cross-feed emphasis there at the end. So take care, my friend. <laughs> have a good weekend. Everybody have a great Groundhog Day, and enjoy the game this weekend. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. God bless you.